Hi gang, Donna here. Today I have the pleasure of sitting down with Sally, who is speaking to me from the Netherlands. She is the host of the Soul Purpose Communication podcast. And today we're going to talk to her about her deciding to get a divorce. Her divorce, her divorce sent her on an interesting journey where she would find herself out of money and homeless at one point. So at the end of the show, I ask her if it was better to divorce or not. So hi, Sally, welcome to the podcast. Hi, thanks for inviting me. It's great to be here. So you said, okay, let's, let's, before we get to the core of the divorce, you were married for how long before you decided to get a divorce? Um, oh gosh, I, um, I can't remember. Um, we were together about nearly 20 years and I think of those 20 years married for about six. Okay. And what precipitated the divorce? Was it something that somebody did or was it just having twins just completely magnified all of the cracks that were in the relationship but before children those cracks were more manageable or less visible but you know the minute twins came everything just fractured magnified everything that didn't work before got 20 times worse Oh, that makes sense. I mean, kid, one kid, one child alone mm. is a lot of stress. So I imagine two yeah. Yeah. needing things all the time. Yeah. So, yeah. so it magnified everything and you decided that you were done or did he? I did. Okay. And After, take, yeah. take us on that journey. Well, you know, the, the, once the kids were eight, about 18 months old, I knew I wanted out and I knew it, uh, it was enough. But I didn't know how, because I was aware that I had these two children. I'd been the trailing spouse. I'd, I'd traveled behind, behind my partner on these journeys and had moved every time he moved, but didn't have a job. So my question was, I've got these two small children. How am I going to sustain a life for us and the, the, my, my, my kids in a country that wasn't my own, in a language that wasn't my own, given that I hadn't worked already for a while? So that's kept me stuck in it for a while. And it was going round and round and round. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? How is it going to be? Until the children were four and a half. And, oh, there's a story before in that just at the same time, we'd, we'd bought a house. My ex was going to live in the house down the street. We were going to like, it was already, we were talking about it. And this, the separation was getting closer. And my ex got diagnosed with cancer. Oh, no. yeah and it was like whoa it was so hard so, what should I do yeah. should I do the choice which was best for me and my health or should I be the bitch from hell and say the marriage is over um and it became really really clear to me that I had to choose for me for me and my children so I remember so clearly we were standing in, in, in the dining room talking about the house, the house down the road. And my ex had decided that it was going to be rented and other people were going to live in it. And it was just, I thought, no, no. If other people get in the house, I'm never going to get rid of you. <laughs> I'm going to get yeah. stuck, you know, because that, that was the escape route. You were going to go there. And then I, I just said, and where are you going to live? And these really small words, and you have to imagine for years, I'd been imagining, planning, fantasizing, thinking. I thought that I'd thought of every route possible. And I had never thought of those little words. Yeah. And the sometimes. words, where are you going to live? That's what changed it. And sometimes just a little, one little sentence like that can change everything. Oh gosh, it changed everything. So what happened at that point? Well, then <laughs> this, uh, this letter, I was such a, it should be a film. This letter went plump on the doormat and we got the letter and it was the instructions from the hospital about the radiation treatment that my ex was going to have for the cancer, saying that as a consequence, there'd be a radiate, radioactive and couldn't actually live with us safely. Because of course, you know, you're, you're, you're radioactive. And then it was like, oh, well, no, I need to go to the other house because of the treatment, because I'll be radioactive. So for the two years that the treatment went on, every, nobody realized we'd split up because the, the story was we're living in different houses because of the treatment and the radiation. 
And it was only when that, that story finished that we actually said, you know, well, we're not going to move back together again. Um, so it was a bizarre journey that was wound up in the treatment, the cancer. It, didn't, it took us a long time to actually divorce. That's why I'm never quite sure when we divorced, because, you know, we split up right. and lived separately. And then uh, I think about three years later that, you know, we started a very complicated, long, difficult divorce that took us two years to fight through. So, you know, it was a whole process, a long, long, old journey. So you said here, you know, when we talked that you ended up homeless and yeah. without money. So yeah, yeah. How, how did this all come about? Well, um, when I was married, I lived the expat life of a wife who was working for, uh, you know, I was the wife of someone who worked for an international organization. Um, so we didn't pay tax. <laughs> we, yeah. lived, we, we, we lived a life of enormous luxury and wealth and privilege, and which had totally shut me off from the real world. Right. I had no idea how stuff worked. No idea, especially not, not in a country that wasn't my own. So when I got divorced, I went, our, our, our monthly income became my annual income. Yeah. And, I, <laughs> and I wasn't ready. I wasn't ready. The stuff you have to pay, I wasn't ready. I, I hadn't saved, not enough. So I just, I just didn't. I just ran out of money. And it sounds, well, I was very, very, very naive, and very had been kept in this. They call it, you know, the gilded cage yeah. for these sorts of lives. Um, and I'd been in this gilded cage, and then coming out was like, whoa, okay, this you have to pay tax on this. Oh, you have to do this for the car because before, you know, the company paid, right. had done everything and organized everything. Everything was was done by magic fairies in the company, and <laughs> and then here I was outside in the real world, like, going, oh, okay, shit, this is how it works. Um, so I ran out of money. Uh, yeah, and my my bank account just dwindled and dwindled and dwindled. But it was one of those pivot moments. So I remember, I got, it was the summer, and I went to stay with a friend of mine in Germany who had like a roof, you know, and I slept in a room in the roof with, 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 with this window and I could see the sky. And I lay there all night watching the sky, thinking, what can I do, what can I do? And I woke up in the morning and just went on the computer. Dun, 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 dun. And it was a moment, it was one of, again, one of those crossroads moments where I started to change my life. I found jobs, applied for jobs, found schools where I could teach, and it, and it and I doubled my prices overnight, and started to shift and shift and shift my working life to the point where I'm at now. Where actually now I run a really nice business, and I'm earning much more closely to the money I used to get before, you know, used to have before when I yeah. was married, and I'm doing it by myself. Um, but it, it, it was like I needed to get to nothing. Yeah. Well, I need go on. No, go ahead. No, I need I needed to get to it was all right. It was I was it, I was getting by before mm -hmm. and whilst it was good enough and comfy enough, I put up with it. But I needed to get to absolute shit bottom nothing. You know, you're nodding. Yes, I do. Yeah, I have I, to, I, I'm, I've been divorced, so I, I understand this. So yeah, I had, to, I had to get to shit bottom nothing where it wasn't comfortable anymore. It was, you know, there was nothing. Literally, I had 70 euros for one summer holiday for me and the kids. Nothing. The freezer was full, thank God. But by the end of the summer, we were chipping peas out of the freezer, you know, <laughs> to, to put into pasta, you know, <laughs> making bread, you know. Yeah. Um, uh, but it was good. I mean, it, 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 I know it sounds bad and it was really stressful and scary at the time. But looking back on it now, I can see that I needed it. Well, that's what I was going to say. Sometimes those experiences shape us as to who we yes. are going to be and, and what we can learn from. And we tend to appreciate more what we have yes. than we used to. Absolutely. Absolutely. It, it, yeah. What you're describing, it's not only my own personal, you know, I haven't done exactly what you did. But I have clients that I read because I read, have read tarot cards mm -hmm. and I, I've heard clients will talk about how their husband handles everything. 
And I just look at them and say, what happens if something, God forbid, something happens and they get in a car accident tomorrow and you have no clue of where anything is? Yeah. 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 Oh, I don't know. Mm-hmm. I mean, there, there's a, you know, I, I don't want to make light of it. It's great that your husband can take care of you. It's wonderful. But you have to understand, I mean, mm-hmm. I was in a car, I mean, I've, because my husband's vision and stuff, I've handled most of the finances. And I picked him up from dialysis. He got in the car and granted, we knew it was on borrowed time. He got in the car. He thought his sugar was low and he died Mm. in the car with me. And had I not, I mean, they brought him back and stuff, but had I not been in control of what was going on for us, then I would be sitting here going, oh my God, what am I going to do? I've always been cognitive of what was going on in my relationship in my prior marriage i got married after three years of being with this person i got married he had two wonderful stepkids and i loved them dearly and it came down to me thinking by the time they were eight and ten um am i going to be able to survive this Mm -hmm. i'm not happy with him i love the kids but my life has meant my life is more than that so i understand what you're exactly what you're saying so i had to make the choice And I had a friend up in Chicago and her mom, and they're like, you can come stay with us. That's fine. You know, you can leave him. And I had my mom's car, but I gave it to him. I left him with $50 in my pocket. I eventually went and got my car in a not so very nice way because I showed up at his work to get his car, my car. Mm -hmm. It was a, my friend, it was a holiday weekend. Actually, it was Memorial Day weekend. And my friend's like, there's cheap tickets. We can go get your car. And I'm just like, I don't want to do that. And she's like, you it's your car yes you're paying the car insurance on it he is not it's your car so we flew down there and i had some things for him and the girls that i had gotten because he left stuff in the house and i went down and i met him at his job he wasn't there he was at lunch he comes and he's like what are you doing here babe and i'm like i'm here to get my car he's like oh no you're here to see me i'm like no i'm not i'm here to get my car and his tone when he finally realized it completely changed he was pissed as hell and i got my car drove down to new orleans had my dad look it over and make sure it was okay but i left with 50 dollars in my pocket and and because i had help just like you i had to make a determination of what i'm going to do with my life and it's been a wild ride it's it's been a wild ride but the thing is it's been very empowering too yes Yes. And, and that's the thing i think we we I was talking to somebody yesterday about the fact that we can choose to be a victim or we can choose to take those lessons and grow from them. So how are your kids? Do you have custody of the kids or? Half, half, half. I mean, they're nearly 18 now. They're 17 and a half. Um, So next year they'll be leaving and they'll go to university. Um, So they're much more autonomous now. My daughter lives with me full time. My son still moves backwards and forwards, half, half between the two houses. Um, how are the children? Mm. You know, uh, I think they'll have their stuff later. Yeah. They'll have their baggage later. You know, I mean, I, I'm, you know, I, 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 I'm still processing the stuff from my growing up. Oh. You know, I didn't, I didn't manage to have them and not pass stuff on. You know, that's, that's the thing, even, even as a step parent, you know, I learned how to be a better step parent, but that didn't mean that I didn't have the baggage from my own mom or my dad. You still do. And I, and we try, you know, if there's that old adage of you're going to be just, you're going to, you know, you're either going to get somebody, you're going to get a kid just like me or like you, or, you know, you, you sit there and your mantra in your head and it's like, I'm going to be a better mother. Well, you try, but then there's always that pitfall that you fall into something you have uttering out of your mouth what that your parents said. And you're like, what the, you know, you're, you're, you're saying it, you're meaning it. And then you stop and you go, what the hell did I just say? It's the exact same thing they told me and I'm saying it. Yeah. 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 Oh God. I mean, we realized that our family had, um, the same pattern in the, um, my mother didn't know her biological father. For complicated reasons and my children have uh, our IVF children from an unknown donor and don't know their father okay you know, 
So within within two generations, we have the same pattern. Right. Um, I mean, I've sort of raised it with my children and said, you know, look, funny, you know, two generations. Please don't make it a third. Right. You know, uh, <laughs> well, that's the thing. I mean, um, I made sure when I looked at my mom, she didn't finish high school. My dad or my grandmother didn't finish high school. And I was bored with high school. By my senior year, I was taking very limited. I mean, I took my credits that I needed, but I thought about it because I'm bored. I'm like, maybe I should just drop. But then it became a, uh, a thing of I'm breaking this pattern. Same thing with they both got married when they were in their teens. I'm like, no, gonna break that, gonna break that. So I did. I mean, and, and that's the thing. We have to try to be conscious of the patterns that our families have taught us to be able to break them. Yes. Yeah. And I don't think everybody's really read it. You, you have to be paying attention to do that. Absolutely. Same thing with, Absolutely. with taking those lessons. I mean, something you, you talked about when I was a kid, you know, my dad, we grew up in New Orleans. My dad was very much, you know, he was a fireman. We, he worked on exotic cars, so he made a good living. And I not only had my bedroom with a double bed, which for a five-year-old is awesome, you know, nice bedroom set. I had a playroom. And we, we weren't rich. We weren't rich, mind you. And we were in a rental house. We didn't own this house, but I had a playroom. And then my dad's old shop had some toys outside in there for me. So I was spoiled. Occasionally I got picked up at my private school in a Rolls Royce. You know, I mean. No, you would have seen, you, right. you would have seemed to be well off. Right. You know? Yeah, yeah. So then, then my parents split and I was, I was, I think, nine when they split, and I went to sleeping on my grandmother's couch, yeah. all my toys being packed, mm -hmm. and just everything being chaos, and that mm -hmm. continued on for a very long time, so mm -hmm. it, it's a matter of those lessons. I look back, and it's like, man, I know that I, if that would have continued, if they would have stayed married, and that life would have continued, I would not be the person I am today. Oh God, yes, yes, totally get it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So I, I yeah. think you know, I think that's what we have to look at. We have to look at our circumstances and and grow from them. Each time we experience something, we have to look at the lesson that's there, and not so much as, oh my gosh, I was a victim. No, look at what you look at the lesson and then reframe it. Absolutely, absolutely it's important. Yes, yeah. Oh, it helps have agency. It helps to create pace in your life. I and mean, if you just I mean, some people choose, I suppose, I guess some people stay, stay where they are. You know, you can also choose not to look, can't you? Some mm -hmm. people do. Um, I, I, I was a, I was a claims adjuster at one point and there was this lady, cause we would always interview people and we would always ask, you know, we would have to take a recorded statement about the car accident. And I remember this lady telling me, I'm like, so how did the accident, what happened in the accident? She's like, well, we were driving and I saw the car coming. Okay. Now, most people would say, I saw the car coming, I would swerve, I would hit the brakes. What she says to me is, I did what I told my son we always do when we're scared. I counted to three and put my hands over my face. Oh no! <laughs> did she get the money though? <laughs> well, it was my insured, so it wasn't so much the money, it was just I had, and I'm like sitting here going, so was there anything you could have done to avoid the accident? No. Really? Wow. <laughs> really? Yeah. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe yeah. not putting your hands over your face. Brilliant. And what, I mean, we're talking about not looking and that's a yeah. brilliant example of, yeah. of choosing not to look. Yeah. You I know. mean, brilliant. A lot of people do that though. They refuse not to see where they're going. And, and that's unfortunate because you can sometimes navigate where it won't be so bad. You know, a side swipe yeah. is much better than a head on collision. Yeah. So. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I suppose if we carry on with the, with, with the, with the driving metaphor, all of it is a journey to somewhere. Mm -hmm. I mean, I haven't liked necessarily some of the roads I drove along, not at all. They were uncomfortable and bumpy and didn't have a map and ooh, 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 I didn't know where I was going. Didn't know if I was going to get anywhere. 
or have to turn around. Sometimes I've gone somewhere, got nowhere, had to come back. But it was all useful in the end. All of it. There's not one part I wouldn't do again. I I used to look at life when I was in college as a long stem red rose. You start out at the stem and you, you want to get to that flower. You want to get to the sweet smell mm -hmm. and the velvety petals. You want to get there. And you have some nice leaves to rest on. But as you're climbing up that rose, there are those thorns. Mm -hmm. And those thorns hurt and they mm -hmm. prick you and they stick you. But that doesn't make the flower any less. Absolutely. Want, you know, you still want Absolutely. the flower. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. And it doesn't make the flower any less sweet when you get there, does no, it? No, mm -hmm. no, no. Mm -hmm. And I mean, you, you. The thing is, we have to keep in context what we're shooting for. We can't just sit there and say, "Oh, the flower is perfect," because I, I notice that in relationships, we always, especially as younger people, we look at the the perfect person, so we think and. Oh, look at that Adonis, look at that body. Okay, but do you realize how much work he puts into that body? Do you? <laughs> if he's putting that much work into that body, how's his ego? And how much time is there to be at home? Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and how much does he need his ego stroked? Oh, that he will have other women flirting with him. Mm. Are you secure enough to deal with that? Mm. Absolutely just yeah. saying i mean you know so let's go back where are you originally from i'm originally from the uk I thought, um, but... brought up on the south coast near dover and if you think about um when you go from england to france on the ferry you usually depart from dover okay. um though so i grew up sort of near the co near the sea in a very small sleepy town um had a nice kind of growing up kind of quite f independent quite free uh yeah it was a, it was a nice place to be did you want to i mean did you meet your husband there no 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 i didn't meet my i didn't know not not until i was 30 okay. so um much older not far away when i was doing my master's degree not, i mean i met him not geographically far away but that's just because i happened to come back to the area to do my master's, um, but that wasn't purely accidental. But uh, you see, here, here's what's a funny thing. You you met him mm -hmm. because you went there. If you hadn't gone there, something else would have happened. I mean, that's where it's going yeah. back to that road. Oh, it's all, it's all these cross points, all of mm -hmm. it. Um, I mean, meeting, meeting my ex meant that I moved to Germany. I meant that I did this whole European thing. So moved to moved to Germany, Italy, France. Wow. Now here, um, so did a whole European life, um, and now post Brexit in England, very relieved not to be there. Very very happy that I brought my kids up here, um, with the education system here, the freedom they have on their bikes to travel around, to be independent very early because it's very safe. I'm very, very glad to be here. Good. I mean, that's a, that's the amazing thing about life is because we we never know where we're actually going to go. Yeah. You may have planned. I'm sure you planned on getting your master's and having this whole little plot of yeah. what yeah. you were going to do. And I'm sure it completely changed. Oh, God, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> if, if, if I'd have had if I'd have done my plan, I would be doing some highfalutin job somewhere probably in london most definitely in england would be earning stacks of money would be single no kids and not have made the inside journey would that's still chasing the outside stuff and that's the thing we we a lot of us get locked into chasing the outside stuff and yeah. we don't look yeah. at yeah. what we can do internally and yeah. that's the real reward i mean yeah. i think that's part of what we're here for is to learn and and heal ourselves yes you know and share our gifts with other people yes. i i had an interesting conversation with a gentleman who was originally from the uk as well um this week he he lives in japan he's been there for 40 years and he's a neuroscientist and so we were talking about um metaphysics well we were also talking about um freemasons and stuff but we we're talking about metaphysics and the fact that he could lay it out how we're in a interconnected and it was very fascinating because, you know, when I started studying tarot and stuff and metaphysical stuff, 
I happened upon Star Wars again, which I love the original Star Wars movies. And it was like, well, really, the force is like metaphysical principles. And basically, when we were talking the other day, that's how he laid it out, that we are all just kind of connected together. And that's how we're getting all this information when you're just meditating and relaxing, which seems weird, but there is science that backs it up because... I absolutely think so. Yeah. I absolutely think so. What's um, funny is... Go ahead. No, go ahead. No, I was no. say, what's funny is so many people are just like, oh my gosh, that's just the devil's work and it's just bad. And, but you're getting the intu your intuitive hits, period. Everybody gets them. It's not because I'll have people tell me, oh, well, I can't do that. Yeah, you can. Everybody can if you just pay attention and go inside. It's back to that internal journey. Yeah. And pay attention. Yeah. Be still, be quiet. Yeah. You know, shut up and listen. <laughs> <laughs> Turn your phone off. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's uh no that 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 so 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 if we're talking about these points, these you know, the whole journey I've made was been to drop the outside world to drop the trappings of money, houses and stuff, to get the inside riches, to get, the, you know, the inside journey, which has, I could never ever put a value on. It's been the most, it is the most uh, astonishing, rewarding thing. Well, and I think, I think the people that have been on the inner journey appreciate that. They mm. recognize that they see, see it for what it is mm -hmm. and you know it's something i've talked about this before with other people and i mean i talk to my clients you know we think that we've learned the lesson and we're good and it's never gonna happen again and it's just perfect and it's like no 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 because those lessons i hate to say are, are i always i always compare it to being dare i say an addict because mm -hmm. you think you got it licked and then there's one little thing that'll trigger you just to say are you sure yeah. <laughs> let's try let's try this out yeah, yeah. you know Absolutely. my my therapist has a, a great thing that she because I, I asked her at one point I'm like why do I keep picking the same friends in my life why do I keep picking the same type of person and she's like well I look at it this way it's like a pothole you're walking down the street you see the pothole you fall into the pothole you bust your knee okay the second time you see the pothole but you're like oh it won't be it'll be fine you step in you fall you hurt yourself by the third time you're like uh -uh, i'm walking around and the fourth time you're like i'm on another block forget this but it takes sometimes those lessons okay. to be repeated yeah yeah or you see them from a different angle or a different level because you've already done the circle a few times mm -hmm. you know or sometimes it's like peeling an apple as well so you get closer in to yourself. It's the same lesson, yeah. but it's closer and closer to your heart. So the nature of it changes or somehow. Um, well, and with you moving, I know you understand this completely because I mean, I've moved to New Orleans, I've moved to Dallas, I've bounced around in the, in the States. And, and the fact is, you know, when you first move, you're like, okay, well now I can create this whole nother person. Life's going to be better. Everything's going to be perfect. Now, guess what? You're still taking you with you. <laughs> and so many people don't, don't realize that. They just think I'm going to pick up and everything's going to be fine. It's like, no, 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 no. Some, somebody I know has just moved to New Zealand with, with exactly that kind of story. Okay. And? <laughs> Same story as here, just in a different location. <laughs> exactly. So. Exactly. And one of my, when I remember my uh, youngest stepdaughter, she had said to me, and I mean, I left my husband, but I still stayed in contact with the kids. And she's like, yeah, I'm thinking about moving. And I'm like, where are you moving to? And she's like, I think I'm moving. I don't even remember now. It was either Portland or Washington. I could be wrong. But she was all excited. And I said, okay, I'm not raining on your parade. Because when she got married, I didn't tell her she was too young. I was just like, okay, go ahead. And I was like, this isn't going to work. But that was her choice. Mm -hmm. So when she's talking about moving, I just said to her, I said, I'm going to tell you one thing. I said, I'm not telling you not to do it. All I'm telling you is you're taking yourself with you. So wherever you go, there you are. She's like, what does that mean? I'm like, yeah. you'll find out. Just understand that you're still bringing you with you and that any problems you have, unless you work on them yourself, yeah. you're taking them with you. Yes. She didn't move. So. She wasn't real. She wasn't. She wasn't convinced at that point. She was doing it. 
So I think I gave her enough food for thought that it was like, okay. But I mean, I picked up at, I picked up at 21 and moved to Texas. At 18, I was living with friends. So, I mean, I bounced around trying different things. And yeah, I've learned that wherever you go, yeah. there you are. Yes, it comes back. You get, you still get the same sorts of people. Yeah. You, get the, you know, talking about your pothole, yeah. you know, no matter where you are, you're going to find them. You're going to get, still get triggered by them. You know, moving is not going to suddenly remove all the people who trigger you. They're going to probably come up quicker and faster. Yeah, because yeah. You, you recognize that. Mm. You recognize that situation. So <laughs> what did you learn about yourself besides having the wherewithal to keep going during this whole thing when, I mean, you were homeless, so you were crashing on people's couches and yeah, I get yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How, that had to be extra hard at the time. Did you have the kids with you? No, that was the really hard because that you know no no. I mean the, the house I'm in now is mm -hmm. a, is a house of a friend of mine, and she'd said to me eventually when it was clear I wasn't going to get social housing, um, she said, well you know come here. She said you know my daughter's left. I've she, I've got a room upstairs. So I eventually after bouncing around for a couple of months came here to live in her spare room and one day she said to me she said sally because we, we it was we got we got on well she said sally you know i don't mind if you stay and she said and i don't mind if you stay maybe even a year or so that was in about august and in october she met her new boyfriend and by december she'd moved in with him and in december you know we rechanged all the house around and my kids moved over here with me mm -hmm. her son stayed with me and since then, I've been in this house, um, which is nearly six years now. But I would never have, I mean, I was never looking to live in this location, in this area. I hadn't, it hadn't even been on my radar. Right. But it was such a good move. Coming over here, it's, it's, the, um, it's the most expensive town in the Netherlands, one of the most expensive to live in. The king lives here. And it's very expensive. But it's forced me to pull up my socks even more. You know, to, to yeah. so I increase my, my fees again. I work more, I work in a different way. Um, I've created more products. I just read a book, you know, so I'm finding many, many more ways to create income for myself. And I, I would never have done it if I'd have stayed in the old place that I were, uh, uh, that, that I lived in. Um, I would never have, have done it because, because again, it was still easy over there and comfortable. You know, each time I come out of my comfort zone, it pushes me further. You know, right. I find that edge. I find the edge between too easy and too difficult. And everything I've done has been about constantly pushing the edge out so that I can keep expanding and keep growing. So what I, do I know about myself, you asked? Yeah. One thing, and it comes from that Australian comedian, Hannah Gadsby from her um, stand-up show. She said, there's nothing stronger than a woman who's been broken, who rebuilds herself. Yeah. And yeah. that's what I feel. Yeah. I mean, when I look back, you know, I, I talk about the triumph of, I left with $50 in my pocket and I survived, but mm. walking away, it wasn't, the pain wasn't walking away from him it was walking away from two girls that I had been a mom to. They even called me mom for four years. And everybody's like, well, they're not your kids. You don't shut that off. You don't. I don't, I mean, if I adopted them, they would have been my kids. You know, there's no difference than me raising them for four years. And that, that took a long time for me to rebuild from. And mm -hmm. he cut, he told me, he's like, you can't talk to them until, until, um, I finally just said one day I packed up pictures, which I really regret now, but I packed up a lot of the family pictures and I sent them to the girls and I'm like, this is for you. You know, here's a letter. This is why I did it. I'm sorry. I never wanted to hurt you guys. And the youngest one reached out to me and she kept reaching out. And so did the older one talked to me too. And then the youngest one had some issues and she wouldn't listen to her dad and she wouldn't listen to her mom. So her dad calls me and says, I need you to step in. I'm like, excuse me, I need you to come down here and visit her and talk to her. I need you to step in and talk to her. Mm -hmm. I'm like, okay. So I did. 
I went down there and I talked to her to play mom and it was good, but it's, it's been a long journey. I got mm -hmm. to go to her wedding and, and, and those were nice things, but ultimately now looking back, yeah, they're not my kids. And I know that, but it took me a long time to get to that point. Mm -hmm. So be happy yeah. you have your kids. Oh, I am. Gosh, gosh. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I yeah. know you are. I know you are. I'm just saying, I don't think people, people don't recognize step parents as because some step parents are really atrocious, but some step parents really do love their, the step kids. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yes, yes. That's my journey. <laughs> well, we get stronger from all of it. Yeah. And there's a resilience, character building, power. Yeah. I mean, I'm finding a, a, a feminine power, mm -hmm. especially now I'm, you know, the, the age that I am, um, a feminine power that I didn't know before. Well, for me growing up, one of the biggest fears I had was being a mother. Oh. I was terrified of being a mom and I, I, you know, my mom told me, well, you'll never, you know, don't ever have kids because you couldn't handle the pain because she was popping zits, which is just disgusting. But yeah, my mom was that kind of, so I just told her, I said at 17, I told her, I said, I'll marry somebody that's got kids or I'll adopt. But always in the back of my mind, because she, my mom mm. she was undiagnosed bipolar, we're pretty sure, plus some other things. So having her as a mom, you never knew who you were going to get. So for me to be a mom, it was kind of like, I'm terrified of this. So when my first husband showed up and he had kids, it was kind of like, okay, I guess we're doing this. Mm -hmm. And so I was fortunate enough to be a stay at home mom at the time, but I learned that I was okay being a mom. I wasn't the worst mom. I wasn't the best mom, I, but I, I got past that. I got past that fear. And I think that's something that we don't realize that if we put so much fear into something, it comes to us yes. to, to either to handle, to face it, to deal with it. And you have to be able to have that resilience to get past it. Yes. Just like you, you know, you, you didn't, you didn't know where you were going to go. So you decided, okay, here's that thought that, that motivates you, that pushes you that I need to make changes yes. instead of going, oh no, I'm a victim. I don't <laughs> know what I'm going to do. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah. so. I think my, my stuff has been about taking responsibility for myself. That's the theme. Yeah. Stand up, take responsibility, own it. Yeah. And, and I think that that's a valuable lesson that a lot of people don't realize that there's a tarot card I have that's a two of pinnacles because I read it with the cosmic deck. And there's this guy walking along on the beach and he's got his hand like this, like, it, it all all that comes to mind is that oh did I do that yeah you did you did don't play naive you did but it, you've seen that happen with so many people they're like oh d did I do that I really now there's sometimes that people genuinely don't know what they did but there's a lot of people that play that game that's like oh I, I didn't I didn't mean to do that oh bs Bull crap! You meant to do it. And you know you meant to yes. do it and own it. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. So you you taking ownership of what you went through. Um, I kind of. It's funny that you mentioned the the fact with the cancer. Not that it was funny, but my my husband who just passed, his first marriage, he had busted his he busted broke his heel, and three days later, his wife said to him honey, I'm moving out and getting a divorce. She was already seeing somebody. She was already seeing somebody, but she, she did that. And I always sat there going, how could you do that? Because that goes back to what you're saying. But the thing is, you don't know the whole story. Yeah. I know his version of the story and that's, you know, that's fine. And we each have our own version. Yes. Oh, yes. So I understand taking care of somebody with cancer would have been a hard push, especially if you, the relationship was already seriously strained. So yes, that letter that came for you guys was definitely a blessing. Yeah, it was so ironic because it was literally me saying, and where are you going to live? Plump, and it landed on the floor. And it was utter cosmic timing, utter. 
you know, on time. It was it was so ironic or not mm -hmm. ironic. If we're looking for signals, if we're looking for, you know, the cosmic energy that joins us, there we are. Oh, you want to get <laughs> cosmic energy. Um, so I got married the first time on the third anniversary of my first date. A month before I got married, my mom, who was already passed, comes to me with my daughter and tells me I need to talk to you. She comes to me in a dream. And I'm like, you're dead. Go away. Because she had been coming to me constantly and I, I never saw her. She, she was cremated and never saw a body. So there was no real closure. So she's like, I need to talk to you. I'm like, no, you don't. You're dead. Go away. Just go away. Fine. So fast forward month, um, I'm baking our wedding cake because, yeah, this was going to be just a small little small town wedding. Baking the wedding cake, the second tier collapses. Okay. That's, that's fine. That's fine. No big deal. No big deal. Um, the day we're supposed to get married, my future husband almost doesn't make it in because he was an over the road driver at this point. So he almost doesn't make it in. Um, he does get there. I'm putting on my makeup and all I have on is foundation. He proceeds to tell me how I have too much makeup on. He then proceeds to yell at me because the kids aren't getting dressed. And I'm like, you need to handle that while I'm doing this. Then just wait. Then, <laughs> then we couldn't, the only people that would stand for us because we lived in a small town and we had just moved there a little while before was our landlord. That was it. Our landlord and her, her husband. And so then the minister didn't bring the right key, so he couldn't get the right book. So he, he almost couldn't marry us, but he ended up get, being able to wing the ceremony. So, yeah. If you wanted any signals. <laughs> <laughs> and, and our marriage, technically, I left him around the same time my mom came to me in a dream about a year later. Yeah. It didn't, I mean, on paper, it lasted because, you know, it was the whole thing. I'm not paying for the divorce, da, 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 da. We're going back and forth. But yeah, everything was there in front of my face. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> and yeah. I was just like, yeah. yeah. But at 24, you're not, yeah, at 24, you're like, no, no, I got the kids. I have my life. This is good. But I mean, he, he took us from Dallas where we were when my mom died to moving us to Indiana, where my mom lived to having no support system right after my mom died. So it was kind of a, a fish out of water. Yeah. You know, how do you, how do you navigate this? And you're living in a place where, you know, you have no support system. Especially with children. Yeah. So it was just, it was kind of a, I, I think I was hanging on for dear life and it took yeah. my friends saying you, you're more than this. Mm -hmm. you need to get out you're more than this i became a dish jockey down there which was cool so i got to play tunes on the radio and stuff but that still wasn't enough and i needed to get out and i did so yeah. i guess the reason i'm telling this is you know if somebody's listening to this listening to your story or my story and you feel trapped yeah. think about think about the exit strategy think about the plan and if your marriage is solid awesome Congratulations. I had 17 great years with my second husband. It was awesome and fantastic. But if you, you know, my husband and I used to have a running joke because his first marriage didn't last a year either. So it's like, you got to get that first one under to the belt. <laughs> <laughs> Not that it always works out that way. Sometimes first time marriages are great, but you know, you, if you're feeling that you need to get out, then do it because you don't need to be trapped. You don't need to be abused you need to find a way to have some kind of roadmap for yourself. Yes. Yeah. You can't live for your spouse or your kids. You have to, you have to live for you. And that's, that's what I had to do since my husband passed mm -hmm. is I had to rediscover who I am after 17 years of coupledom to, mm -hmm. because everybody knew us as a couple. Yeah. So you got to figure mm -hmm. out who you are then. Yeah. That's and tough. Yeah, but I'm sure you've had, you had to do the same thing. You had to figure right. out who you were besides a mom and, and a wife and you've rediscovered yourself. And that's yeah. the thing we all, we can all try to put ourselves in different little boxes to who we are, but ultimately we have to come back home to us. Yes. Yeah. 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 And that's it. Whatever journey you're making, 
you are just coming home to yourself. And it's a lovely way to complete the circle, isn't it? Yeah. Coming home to ourselves. Yeah, because I mean, ultimately, your parents aren't going to be here forever. Mm. Ultimately, you have to take those lessons. And if you don't, you know, I, I, t I have friends that are like, I can't stand my family. Well, I moved away because I couldn't handle my family. Do I, is my dad still alive? Yeah, sure he is, but he can't hear and we text occasionally, but there's not that need for me to have his approval like there used to be. And I think that's something, I don't know about where you grew up, but over here, there was a big push for a long time of you need your parents' approval. You don't want to tick off your parents. Mm, don't know. Uh, I, I just wanted to get away. I think we all did, but I mean, we, I left it, we, at eighteen. I left at eighteen and went to Milan wow. um, to 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 get out, to get away. Approval or not, they didn't want me to go, but I was going. Um, I was so pissed off for them by then. Um, that was fine. <laughs> I wanted I wanted to be I wanted to be gone. So what um, did you do in Milan? I taught English. It was my first teaching. It was my you know I was eighteen. Um, it was my first teaching. So uh, uh, teaching English to uh, Italian kids. Um, that's what started me on teaching. Um, yeah, yeah. So uh, and yeah, and that's what started me on this sort of European thing. I went back to England just for my, my undergrad and my postgrad. But then, you know, I've lived over here in Europe longer than I've ever lived there. But you see, most people, that's the same. I mean, I did the same thing. Um, my mom tossed me it. My mom tossed me out of the house at 18. But there's a reason why. Um, she had threatened constantly to send me to live with my dad after the divorce. If I acted out, that was her, her contrition. You know, even though sometimes I wasn't even living with her, she had me living with a teacher friend of hers, but she would threaten to send me to live with my dad. And at like 15, 16, she would tell me, oh, one day you're gonna fall flat on your face and I hope I'm there to see it. But then she would tell me you can do anything you put your mind to. So this is what I'm getting at. You know, try having a mom like that. You're like, yeah. so at 18, she she helped me buy a car and she took out a loan in, a month before my birthday. And she took out a loan, a small six month loan, and she wanted me to pay it off in two months. She promised to give me my child support check. She 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 picked out this car from the dealership she worked at on the way home. Basically, the engine blew it was leaking oil I, I would have to get the engine serviced and she tells me she's like you have to pay the car off in two months I'm like I can't do that you want me to get this thing fixed and you want me to pay the loan off I'm working at a drugstore yeah not making that much money yeah well it's your and this is how she put it to me exactly it's your car or your friends and my friends and I had already talked about me moving in over at their house. So she's like, I'm like, I can't afford the car. She goes, it's your car or your friends. I said, I can't afford the car. Last time, car or your friends, can't afford the car, then get out of my house. Okay. I think it was two weeks after my 18th birthday. So I go in my room and I pack up as much stuff as I can put in my friend's car because my friend's here to pick me up anyway. So... I go over there, we have a fun time that night, no no drinking, just staying up all night talking and I can't believe I'm doing this. I'm gonna crash on their couch until we can get the guest, the, the room cleaned up and I can move in there. Next morning, 7.30 in the morning, you can come back home that, no, phone call. You can come back home now. No, sorry, not doing it, not doing it. I stayed gone for a year and a half. I eventually did go back for a bit, but you know, Mm -hmm. you, you you when somebody pushes you like that and I mean it wasn't here's the thing there was no way possible I could do what she wanted me to do yeah if I could have I would have done it but there was no way so you gave me an opportunity and because you had sat there and threatened so many times it was just like all right I'm out of here yeah and it was yep the amazing thing about that is I used to say I'm I'm sorry all the time and I never picked up on it. Never ever did I pick up on it. And my roommate at the time, we were somewhere one day and she looks at me and she goes, Why do you say you're sorry all the time? I'm like, what are you talking about? 
She's like, all the time. Those are like your favorite words. If somebody says that they're not happy, you're like, I'm sorry. You didn't do anything to make them unhappy. You didn't do anything because the menu didn't have that item. You did not do anything. So why do you say it? Mm -hmm. And it made me stop and look at things. And the interesting thing is living with those two friends of mine, I dropped like 50 pounds. My whole mentality changed. I got out of the I'm sorry. It was an amazing journey and you don't realize how toxic somebody is in your life until you're away from it absolutely so absolutely. yeah 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 i mean that's a whole other a whole other show <laughs> <laughs> um that's a whole other show um crikey yes 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 i mean, I'm I sure mean you... I suppose we're always going to have them we're always going to have yeah. toxic people in our lives and like we have these themes that keep coming up in the conversation. It's so how are we going to deal with them? Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I, I'm never going to be able to not see and experience toxic people. They're always going to be there. But now I'm more vigilant. I'm more aware. I'm more conscious and choose how I deal with them. Right. Um, you know, narcissists are the ones I'm very vulnerable for because my mother's a narcissist. So it's something that I know. And if I'm not very, very, very careful, I can fall into it incredibly easily. Um, and then kind of like, we'll go, oh shit, you know, here I am again. Um, well, so that's the, I was gonna say, that's the interesting thing is we tend to, I don't know, but you said you're, the narcissist is your weakness. I would always pick friends that were, had a similarity to my mother. Yeah. And it's, that's when you're just kind of like, you don't realize you do it either until like you're, you're really into the friendship and then you're like, wait a second <laughs> yeah well it's so known it's so e i mean i know exactly how to be around these people mm -hmm. it's so it's comfortable it's known it's easy it's an easy pattern mm -hmm. you know um uh, and it's that's why it, it yeah it's for me it's so easy to yeah to fall into it yeah and they don't I and especially narcissists they don't always expose themselves that easily no. so it could be a while before you go oh god i've got one you know um so yeah but that's that's life i mean that's 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 it that's what you know i've learned to deal with it now i learned to get out of it quicker with narcissists just withdraw cut the contact done i think that happens with age because one of the friends that i was talking about earlier um she's been trying to pull me back in for like the last year or so and it's just like eh -eh, i'm done we're not playing the game. You, I know who you are. I recognize who you are. I'm not that person that you took advantage of before. Yes. And, and that's the thing. It's like, once you see, cause this person, she, my mom had been dead maybe two years. My mom committed suicide. And as a friend, she would sit there and I, I owe her kudos because she gave me a place to get out. Her mom gave me the place to get out of my marriage, but she would sit there and tell me when she had a bad day, I'm going to kill myself. Ooh. And she never did. She had no intention of really doing it. It was a manipulation because she knew because of what I had gone through that she could manipulate me that way. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, now she's reached out and it's just kind of like, mm -mm, no, mm -mm. not gonna, we're not gonna be Facebook friends. Sorry. Mm -mm. <laughs> sorry instagram nope sorry block bye 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 yeah, yeah, can't do yeah, it yeah. I, I can't i can't go back there absolutely and you don't have to justify it no i've learned that no is enough about anything that's i used to come up with whole stories it's like nah, nope don't do it nope but see that's a hard thing to learn for some people i mean that was a hard thing for me to learn to say no because because of having the mother I had, it was such an easier thing to become a people pleaser. You to to please. It comes with the I'm sorry. Yeah, I mean all those things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But this is why. I mean, we you know this is why we do the process. Yeah. This is why you know we're some some people are choosing to wake up, get more conscious, find the triggers, um, peel back the layers. Right. You know. This is why this, this is the whole point. Well, for me, you know, not the whole point, but part of what I'm doing here. Well, like my books, I, I tend to write realistic fiction. And, and I realized as I was writing something about my character, um, my mom always had said that my dad was a knight in shining armor on a big white stallion until, you know, after the divorce, then he became the 
his armor was rusted and he was riding on a jackass. You know, I realized I didn't think anything about this because my dad's mom one time told me, she's like, well, your mom just wanted to get out that house. And I'm like, yeah, right. I was writing this in, in my story as a character and I was like, wait a second. That is exactly the metaphor that that says the truth behind what my grandmother said, because if she thought my dad was the knight in shining armor coming in to rescue her. Yeah. And yeah. a lot of us do that. We look for somebody else to rescue us when the, the fact of the matter is the only person that can rescue us and save us is ourselves. Absolutely. So um, you said you had a book that you wrote. What's the book about? I've just written a book called Conversations with Myself. And it's come from my podcasts and it's based on loosely insights I've had and the conversations that I've created with myself as a result and what I learned from it. So it tracks from the beginning where I, I, I was broke and I ran out of money to the, the last one. There's 14 in there. The last one, which is kind of more where I am now um, so, to, 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 to track a journey. Um, so it's not yet out in the world, but it's nearly, nearly, nearly there. So literally the next couple of weeks, it's going to nice. go out. Yeah, I'm really excited about it. Are you yeah. doing it on Amazon or where are you releasing it? Amazon. I'm going to do it on Amazon, uh, ebook. Um, so uh, yeah, and it'll be uh, there and it will be on my website, you know, as well. So um, yeah, it's my first one. So uh, I've wanted to do a book for a long, long, long time. And this set felt so uh, natural. The first one is always the hardest, even though it seems like yours isn't so much fiction, it's still the hardest one, always. You know, it's, I think so, I think so. My, my CD-ROM is, lit, not my CD-ROM, what do you call that thing in the computer, the memory thing in the computer. Um, it's just littered with books I've started and not finished. And well, that, go ahead, no, go ahead. And well, now, now I want to, now I think I've got the, the the, the practice, the discipline, I'm more focused. It's, it's a, it's a long process. And the thing is you have to worry, you know, especially in fiction, you have to worry about imposter syndrome and that that's a, a big deal. So, you know, I have, I have two books out and I'm working on my third and fourth and mm -hmm. yeah, there's always, I, I finished a book actually in 2019, that was supposed to be the follow up in the series. And I'm like, I don't like the character just is not true to who he is. So I gutted it. And it's like, now I'm, I had to start from scratch. Mm -hmm. I, I kept some pieces, but you know, it's, it's a process. It really is a process. And you, you can't get caught up in your head trying to make perfection because somebody's going to love your book and somebody's going to hate your book. And absolutely. And that's the same with everything. It's the same with the podcast. It's, just, you know, you, I, I, I don't write for everyone. Not, right. not everyone is to me right. um, in that respect of that. I think people will have to be picky. You know, they'll have to like me and um, what I'm saying. And it can't be everyone. No, that's OK. I, I mean, that's that's what I've learned. It's like, you know, somebody asked me or the one lesson you have and somebody has asked me this, who's your audience? And I've gotten to the point where it's like because I write realistic fiction it's not going to take you necessarily on this fluffy pony ride. It's got really realistic, gritty topics. And I realized, well, the person I write for is me. Yeah. And if I find an audience that likes it, awesome. And I hope I do, but I write it because it's a journey for me. I enjoy getting in these heads of these characters and God knows they wake me up in the middle of the night sometimes. Yeah. So <laughs> that's what, you know, the woman who wrote eat, um, eat pray, love. Uh huh. She said she wrote it for herself and yeah. she never expected anybody to be interested in the story of her divorce, you know, mm -hmm. and, and it, she never expected to, to do what it did. Um, and I think that's the thing you write for yourself. If you write for someone else, you're already outside yourself. Right. I mean, I, I have, like I said, I had two. My second book that I released, and I've heard this quite a bit lately because I've promoted a little bit more. I keep hearing, I read it in a day. And when I hear that, I'm like, that makes me feel good because it's like, I kept you engaged. I did my job as a writer, you know, that's, that's like high praise. So it's, it's one of those things where it's like, there's a process, but I can't let that get yeah. in my head because then yeah. it's like, well, is the next book going to be as good? I don't yeah. know. Yeah. yeah. 
absolutely absolutely it's just bomb on chair pen on paper on there and the yeah. sort of you know yeah, yeah absolutely so what is your website? I, I have your sole purpose communications. Yeah, yeah, www.soulpurposecommunications.com. Okay. All right. That's why I just wanted to make sure because I have the one that you had on um, Matchmaker. <laughs> and that was the sole, sole purpose communication dot simplecast. Oh, um, yeah. Because it was for the podcast. Yeah. Yeah, it was for the podcast. Um, so the podcast is on Simplecast, but um, I've got the website, which has got the podcast and the blogs. Okay. And it's, it's going to have some new stuff on it soon. So um, yeah, it's uh, got a slightly different name, the, the website. Okay. I'll make sure I put all the links on the podcast and YouTube will be up on Sundays as always. Uh, so that'll be next Sunday. But anyway, I thank you for, for joining me. It's been a pleasure. It's been fun. Um, and uh, you take care. You Bye too. Game.